Hi, I'm Charlie, and one of the things I do here at Precision Matthews is help people plan their machine orders and make sure that we're including everything they need to get started. Anytime I'm helping a customer with a lathe order, the same question inevitably comes up. What chuck or combination of chucks do I need to include to get the most out of this lathe? Everyone's order is a little different, but I still end up sharing some of the same universal information each time, enough that I think the subject warrants its own video. So today, we're gonna go over in broad strokes what types of lathe work holding you might use and why. Let's get started. We all come into this world equally naked, so we're starting with the bare spindle. I'll put the trusty piece of OSB down to protect the ways, and then mount our three jaw chuck. If you're not familiar with the D1 style cam lock mounting system, it's super simple. Basically, the studs in the back of the chuck go into corresponding bores on the spindle and are drawn in with cams around the radius of the spindle. For the D1 4 standard that this is, there are three studs spaced 120 degrees off from each other. Note that each of the cam locks has a mark on it that starts at 12 o'clock. And then when you tighten it down, it needs to be somewhere between 3 and 6 o'clock. In this case, it goes to about five o'clock, which last I checked was between three and six, so we're good. Once all three cams are snugged down, you can go ahead and give them one final push. You don't have to get the cheater bar out, but you should be turning pretty hard. Once that's done, we're ready to go. For these demonstrations, I have a half inch gauge pin that will serve as our sample workpiece. The advantage of the three jaw chuck is that it's very quick to set up. The disadvantage is that you're not gonna get perfect concentricity. Here we have about four thou of run out, and that won't matter if we're turning a new part from stock and we can do it all in one setup. But if we're trying to do work on an existing part, we may need better concentricity than that. And yes, this model is an adjustable three jaw chuck, so we could dial that run out to zero, but not all three jaw chucks have that feature, so I'm skipping that for now. Maybe we'll talk about that in a future video. I'll rate all these work holding options on four criteria out of five stars, and I'll use the very scientific process of making a number up off the top of my head. So for the three jaw chuck, I'm gonna say ease of setup is four out of five stars because you just put the workpiece in and clamp it down. Versatility is gonna be three stars because you can hold round stock with the jaws in the normal position, or flip the jaws around and hold larger round stock. Concentricity is where the three jaw suffers with one star, but we generally use the three jaw chuck on parts that can be cut all in one setup without unclamping the jaws. And clearance for tool access is not bad. I'll give it three stars. Next up is the four jaw chuck. One thing you'll notice immediately is that we're in fast motion because where the three jaw chuck takes a couple seconds to set up, the four jaw is more like a couple minutes. There are people more adept at dialing in four jaw chucks than I am, particularly machinists in job shops or gunsmiths where you're dialing in already existing parts. But if you don't work with a four jaw chuck every day, figure it'll take a couple minutes to set any parts up. The advantage though, is that you get great concentricity if you're willing to stare at the needle of your indicator while making minute adjustments. So for the four jaw chuck, we take a hit on ease of setup with two stars, but I'm giving high marks for versatility at four stars, since we can hold square parts and some oddly shaped parts in addition to round stock. If you're willing to take the time to dial a part in, concentricity is five stars, and I'm putting clearance at three stars, same as the three jaw chuck. Next up is the 5C collet chuck that we offer. If you're wondering why I included clearance as a grading criteria for these chucks, it's because the collet chucks are really gonna shine here. Instead of jaws whipping around, it's just the smooth body of the chuck. That may not seem like a big deal, but there are times when that access is invaluable. There's quite a lot of cranking to draw the 5C collet into the taper, but if you're working with a lathe that has a collet closer mounted, it's very quick to install and remove 5C collets. We also have an ER40 collet chuck that serves a similar purpose to the 5C chuck. 
The upside to ER collets is that they're a little more flexible in the size of stock that each collet can hold, with the slight downside of having to fill the entire depth of the collet for it to hold securely. If your part doesn't fill the entire depth of the collet, you can put a plug in the back, and that's what I'm doing here, putting the gauge pin in the front and an end mill in the back. You all can argue in the comments whether the 5C or ER40 collet chuck is the right tool for a lathe, or you can be like me and get both and accept that you'll never stop buying tools. If your family views your tool buying habit in the same light as a minor drug problem, that's about where you want to be. We won't make a distinction between the two types of collet chucks and we'll grade them together as a pair. For ease of setup, I'm giving them four stars. You can bump that up to five if you have the collet closure on your lathe. Versatility is a one though, as you can only hold round stock that is the dimension of the collets that you have on hand. Concentricity and clearance are both fives, so as long as you're working with dimensional stock that you can hold in a collet, there's not much reason to use anything else. Next up is the black sheep of the work holding family, the faceplate. Also making a return appearance is the weird sample part that I made for the mill DRO videos. For this setup, we'll pretend that we want to bore out the hole near the center of this part. I use the live center to hold the part in place while I clamp it down. That generally gets you within a thou or two of concentric. If you need better than that, you're in for a fun time of tapping your part this way and that while staring at an indicator and slowly increasing your clamping pressure. Face plates are sometimes the only way to hold something, particularly oddly shaped castings. They're a pain to set up, and there's a definite pucker factor to spinning the whole thing up for the first time, but often there's just no other way. So on the face plate, for ease of setup, I'm giving it negative 100 stars. Versatility, however, is five stars, since it'll hold anything you can fit within the throw of your lathe and safely clamp in place. Concentricity? How much do you like tapping parts back and forth? I'm giving this a score of as much as your sanity allows. And finally, most setups will have some sort of spinning clamps of death associated with them. So for clearance, I'm giving it a skull and crossbones instead of a star rating. That seems kind of dire, but some of the most satisfying jobs I've done on the lathe have involved some sketchy setup on the faceplate. So I'm going to add an additional sense of accomplishment category and give the faceplate five stars. So there you have it. There's no one best chuck for everything, but there is usually a best choice for your specific operation. I hope this video helped cover some of the basics about making that choice. Of course, everyone's needs are a little different, so always feel free to call and talk to someone here in the tech department about what chucks you might need to include when you're putting together your lathe order. And we love reading the comments on these videos, so sound off below if there's anything you think I forgot to include, or let us know about the sketchiest faceplate setup that you've managed without an unplanned projectile incident. Until next time, thanks for watching.